following podcast contains information and opinions that are solely the views of the hosts and guests and are not intended to represent employers, organizations, or other entities with which the participants may be affiliated or associated. We hope you enjoy Military Historians or People Too. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm over here. I think I'm the only person in the building. I'm sure you're breaking some rule. Oh, I am. Um, but you're essential personnel. Uh, well, I guess. Uh, but yeah, there was only one car in the parking lot, and they had everything locked up. I had to swipe to get in, so they'll know I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Bob, how are you? Very good. How are you? Good. Sorry Bob. about all the back and forth and everything, man. Um, no, yeah. it, ha- Ian, it happened. Ian, Ian was making stuff a little... Uh, a little weird. It seems like it's Miss Statesboro, right, Brian? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my yard is is messy, um, but that's it. I mean, my neighborhood had a few trees come down, but uh, you know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. So, uh, you know, we've certainly seen a lot worse, and it looks like we might not even get rain today. I was to say it's it just started raining here about thirty minutes ago. But I think Charleston's so, going to get a pretty good pounding. Yeah, I think they're going to get popped pretty good. So, yeah. but so. Well, I, th- I think we're going to be good, uh, hopefully without any power outages or anything like that. So yeah. we'll see. <laughs> Certainly good to hear. We'll try it. We'll try it. Bob, I feel like I've been introduced to you at the SMH before, but I don't think we've ever, you know, had a drink or a dinner or anything. So uh, nice we'll to see have, you. We'll have to fix that. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's capable of fixing that. I, I know he is. Yeah, yeah. He, he can he can take care of that for sure. <laughs> Well, okay, your your name is giving me a really hard time because my German just keeps wanting me to say, uh, you know, Bob Vettemann. Uh, so hey, that's uh, fine. <laughs> that's the family, original pronunciation. At least you're getting it right. So. Your family never dropped the double N, so, uh, you know. No. <laughs> Although a lot of people try to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you keep the uh in there. It's Wettemann, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, let's All do right. our shout outs real quick. Yep. Uh, as always, uh, hello to our great friends uh, out at the ranch in Lawrence, Kansas, University Press of Kansas, and all university presses. Please support university presses. Buy books from their websites if you can. History Behind the News, Adele Ali's podcast. He's always doing interesting things. Uh, Phil Shackelford's uh, Modern Scholar, same there. And we had a shout out to, to Kelly DeVries and Bowen Blade in a while, but man, they're they're, they're getting like thousands of plays. Yeah, he he goes over right? in one episode what we get combined. Yeah, I think he said he gets like he gets like ten thousand plays per episode. I, I think it's like because they meet in a bar. I, that, maybe <laughs> that's our maybe that's our, our shortcoming. Uh, speaking of that, Brian Lynn, we're going to be in Amsterdam together. Oh, nice. So we're thinking maybe we uh, broadcast back to you in Statesboro from a coffee house in Amsterdam. I have a better idea. <laughs> you come too? <laughs> it's the same. It involves me going to Amsterdam. <laughs> no, that works. That works. We can uh, we can do that. You guys can go uh, shack up at one of the bulldog locations. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll see and, what we can do. And I'll be here. I know. Hey, it'll come around to me. So at some point, I'll get stuck here in Spartanburg, and you'll be somewhere cool. All right. And finally, for me, uh, my my good friends at Bowling Green State University, I was there this past uh, Tuesday to give the Gary R. Hess lecture in policy history. Uh, Gary was my mentor there. It was great to see he and Rose, but really a great time. Spent the whole day. Ben Green, uh, professor there. We also need to interview. He taught with Dadis and and John Gentile at at West Point. He was there Mm -hmm. for a while before he went to Bowling Green. But great guy. Uh, he and, and uh, everybody there just really treated me wonderfully. Got to talk to his Vietnam class, which was a lot of fun. Had lunch with graduate students. And all they wanted to talk about was the podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That's all they care um, about these days. Right. And I'm just like, look, as we've said before, we're just proving that any jackass can do a podcast. So, <laughs> but they were, they were really good, but they were eager to push the pod. They were eager, eager to push the pod. So I, I, I won't stand okay. in their way. I sent him a little bit of swag uh, yesterday. Oh, great. Good, good. Is a, is, a th- is a thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the talk went, I think, great. Uh, about 100 people there. And, and you know, nobody got up and left, which was pretty stunning. So, you know, 
can't complain. But it was a fun time. It felt good to be back at Bowling Green. I hadn't been there in a long time. And um, yeah, beautiful campus, good vibe with the students everywhere. Uh, good, good, good day. So I enjoyed it thoroughly. That's all I got. All right. I got nothing. Um, you know, maybe a little shout out to my students. Uh, a lot of them headed home to Atlanta uh, because of the hurricane. So hope they all got there safely. And, um, you know, fortunate that, that Ian has has missed us here in Statesboro, but it is hitting other people. So uh, thoughts with those people who are who are having to deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure you did a great job, though, putting your courses online. I did. I Good. put them online. Um, As directed. I, and I put everything from my yard into my shed and tied stuff down. Spent about an hour and a half outside, you know, tying the grill to the to the uh, carport and all that kind of stuff. But uh, looks like looks like I don't need to do it. But yeah, hey, I'd rather waste that hour and a half than get hit with a hurricane again. Yeah, so, exactly, exactly. Yep. All right, let's interview right, introduce our we? guest. Yeah. All right. So today we have uh, Dr. Robert Bob. Um, Wenneman, who is Associate Professor of History at the United States Air Force Academy. He served as the Director of the Air Force Academy Center for Oral History. He was the founding director uh, from 2010 through 2014, and he was the Max F. James Distinguished Researcher in Character and Leadership Development at the Air Force Academy Center for Character and Leadership Development. Uh, he began his tenure at the Air Force Academy as a visiting professor, and prior to that, Bob was an associate professor of history at McMurray University in Abilene, Texas. Ooh, go Warhawks! And, uh, yeah, and while right? he was out there, Warhawks. he served as the director of their public history program. Cool. Bob also worked with the Command Historian's Office of the U.S. Army Special Operations Command, and he is a proud alum of the History Department at Oklahoma State University. And after finishing his undergrad there, he went on to earn his MA and PhD in history at Texas A&M. Bob is the author of Privilege Versus Equality, Civil Military Relations in the Jacksonian Era, 1815 to 1845. And that one was done with Prager Security International in, 20, in uh, 2009. He's also the uh, co-editor with Lieutenant General Retired Christopher D. Miller of Contrails, um, and he did the 2016-2017 um, volume of that, and uh, the Air Force Academy publishes that. And of course, he's written numerous other essays uh, and articles. Um, he recently completed another manuscript titled The Patriot, an American Golf Odyssey. I want to ask you about that a little bit later on, and that was done in cooperation with the Folds of Honor Foundation. Bob is, a ded is dedicated to his students and the profession. He is a frequent presenter at meetings of the Society for Military History, and he's been recognized for his mentorship at both the Air Force Academy and McMurray. In 2017, he received the Stephen L. Orison Award for Mentoring Excellence from the Department of History at the Air Force Academy. So uh, we know you've got stuff to do, Bob. Uh, you got to go teach today. Um, and so we'll get right into it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We can start out by asking where you're from, uh, how you got into history, what did your parents do? I know the answer to this uh, to a certain extent because it turns out your dad's kind of a big shot. Yeah, um, you know, I'm <laughs> proud of my old man. Yeah, um, you know, I, I in, in the military you have army brats, you have air force brats. I was a university brat, um, except I that meant being at one university, um, you know, which is kind of exceptional now. My dad uh, started on faculty at Oklahoma State in the spring of 1973 and just retired a few years ago uh, oh, wow. after 42 years of service um, in the animal science department, which is part of the reason why I'm a historian, because if you know anything about reproductive physiology, that would move you in a different direction entirely. But um, you know, when, it, when I was in high school, growing up in Stillwater, Oklahoma, I was on very much on at least what I thought was an engineering track, had, had considered um, the academies, but was already at a point where I was thinking historically a lot. When I was in high school, I was employed at a public library. And if you're familiar with the Dewey Decimal System, I found myself in the 940s and the 970s all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, knowing that, knowing what the academic lifestyle was like, it was, it wasn't an, a difficult jump for me to say, hey, you know, I like this history stuff. This is what I think I want to do. And, you know, when, it, when I started Oklahoma State in fall of 1993, first thing I did when I was assigned to my undergraduate advisor said, yeah, I want to declare a history. I want to do it now. And he's like, no, you can't do it. You got to get a semester under your belt. I'm like, why? This is what I want to do. And, you know, spring of my freshman year, I end up taking, a, you know, a 400 level history class. And you know, I, st I still have the exam uh, where the professor wrote after I got an A, you know, 
how are you in this class as a freshman? Not that I'm complaining. Yeah. And, you know, that, that was kind of, that was kind of the path that, that I took almost immediately. You know, I, I, I went into my undergrad with a philosophy. Okay. I'm going to grad school. I got, I've got to do well. I've got to start setting myself up and, you know, Oklahoma state A&M, you know, got, got, ended up with a really great advisor in Chip Dawson. I'll give him a little shout out. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. You know, here, here, here I am today. So do you, real quick, did, did, was, what was there when you were a kid that kind of turned you on? I mean, what, what did you get into? Was it, you know, movies or books or going places? Well, you know, when I was a kid, my, my parents are both from Connecticut and every summer we would drive from Oklahoma to Connecticut and, you know, to, to break up a three day drive back when the speed limit was 55 and we, we, we typically find somewhere to go. I have two younger sisters and we'd all get to pick a stop at some point between Oklahoma and Connecticut. And I found just about every historic site between here and there, and they found just about every mall. So, you know, it was kind of a, kind of a trade-off. And, and I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but, but that was really kind of what, you know, when, it, when I, when I started, started, you know, the history bug started biting me. And then, you know, by the time I was in, in high school, really get involved. The, the other gateway drug to to the historical profession for me was the living history community and getting into some reenacting. And, oh yeah. And, you know, so what'd you do? Of, kind of snowballed from there. What'd you do? Well, I started out doing some eighteen twelve stuff up in Missouri at, yeah. at Fort Osage, right there outside of Independence. And then with um, I was you know two hours from my front door to Fort Gibson in in Indian Territory, and three hours down to Fort Washita. So I kind of started doing things there, and you know that got me on. The path ultimately to my my master's thesis and my dissertation topic and and it helped pave the way you know when, when I had that first job doing public history I'd really created a public history program on my own at AM because I really didn't have one yeah so doing right. a couple of um, museum internships um, doing historical archaeology as an outside field in my graduate work so it, it kind of set me on a path to where I am today yeah, I looked at the dates there. You were kind of doing public history before public history was cool. You know, back before there was, uh, you know, this kind of uh, emphasis on public history that there is now. Um, yeah, like actual program. Yeah. Where, uh, where are your mom and dad from in Connecticut? Uh, my dad's uh, from North Guilford, right outside of New Haven. And, okay. Yeah. And my, mom, my mom's from North Franklin, just north of Norwich. Okay. My mom, uh, my mom, my wife is from Connecticut. Uh, so uh, I've, I spent a lot oh, of time there. That was a there. Freudian slip. I know my mom is from Connecticut. I was thinking of my mom cause I almost gave her a shout out. It's her birthday this month and I forgot. So I'll give her that, uh, I'll give her that, that shout out. Now you are in Stillwater pretty much, you know, your entire young life, right? I mean, that's uh, you know, you grow up in the town, decide to stick around there. Um, was it hard for you to leave after you'd been there for, you know, that's all you've ever known? No, it was time to go. Okay. You know, it, it was it was one of those things I, I, I'd done. I'd, I'd finished my undergrad. I was ready to go to grad school. I was ready to go. And, and, and even that that transition from from high school to college, you know, it was it was a it was a tough three and a half mile drive to my dorm, to my <laughs> parents house. But, you know, it, it got me into a new environment, got me around new people. And, you know, still still some of my best friends are guys I lived with when I was a freshman. Did you yeah. ever did you ever think that it would be hard to stay there? Like, you know, because you'd always be, you know, Professor Wedeman's kid. It's a big enough university. Right. In four years, I only ran into my dad walking across campus by chance once. Really? Wow. Now, I saw him just about every week in his office because I went there. Yeah. But right. to just have a happenstance meeting only yeah. happened once in four years. I, I grew up in a small town in East Texas. And I think that's one of the things that motivated me to move away was just, I don't know if I could handle being, you know, Tommy Allison's kid for the rest of my life being yeah. in that town. And, and some people well, you know, that do that and do fine with it. You know, it's, I'm not, but, but for me, it just was, I knew that was going to be difficult being. Well, and I, and I, I had the challenge being a junior also, you yeah. know, so, so if, if my, my dad introduced himself first, how, how do I follow it up? Yeah. You know? And, and he always said, if, if I introduced myself first, he would say he was the real Bob Wedeman. And if I, he introduced himself first. I would say I was the new and improved, but you know, I, I, I say I had the same thing. I was the third. So yeah, we had the same boat, man. Same boat. Exactly. Did, uh, did anybody ever call you Bobby? Um, and, my, and live sisters, to tell it? my sisters still do. Uh, I was going to um, say, I have, yeah, I have, I have one friend here in Colorado Springs. Who's the little sister of my best friend who, you know, coincidentally both grew up with me in Stillwater and now both live here. 
Hmm. And she's about the only person that can get away with it. So my uh, my grandfather was Robert, but everybody in the family, his brothers all called him Bobby. And I've got a friend here in Statesboro and uh, was hanging out with him and his his uh, sister showed up from Florida and she immediately started calling him Bobby. And I was like, that brings back some memories. Um, so I say that not as like, you know, people calling you that in some kind of, uh, you know, insulting way. But uh, I think in families that that's, that's kind of go to. Yeah, yeah. It's endearing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So how'd you decide on a and It's where I got in. <laughs> that's a you common answer how, on this show. Yeah, to say that's a common <laughs> answer. That, that's it's one of those. You, hey, it's where it's where you get in, and you know, went there with with nothing in the way of support, and you know, it's it's one of those things where I learned a lesson early on. It's good to be visible, and it's good to be around, and it's good to let people see you because within the first week, they had yep. an assistant ship fall open, and it, you know, they needed somebody, and I happened to be around, and. You know, that was that was the beginning and it and it sure made things a whole lot easier. That's surprising that you didn't have support. I mean, you were an honor graduate, you know, back in I mean, yeah, we we go through these periods where you know funding is tight and places just don't have money to uh, to hand up. I was I was in a similar situation. I graduated in December and uh started without funding for the MA. And then, you know, like you said, been there for a very short period of time. Somebody dropped out and there I was. Grad students go hang out around the office. <laughs> yeah, there's something to be said for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but probably the best advice for graduate students, get to know the department admin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get in good with them. Absolutely. Do, don't don't do not piss off the office. No. I mean that's that's and, just and, and, and I, yeah. And and I will say that and I want to own a publicly offer my congratulations. She just retired a few weeks ago. He, she was our the 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 head poncho in the in the history department, Texas AM, Mary Johnson. Tremendous mm-hmm. career. Thanks so much. Um, love you for all that you've done over the years. Um, but yeah. Get to know your office staff. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Get to know your office staff. So, what did you work on with Chip? Uh, ended up doing 19th century civil military relations. Kind of gravitated, you know, at, at a at a time. Bill, you probably remember when when military history wasn't accepted as it as it is now. Yeah, um, you know, tr- carefully trying to balance one foot in the the political realm, one foot in the social cultural realm, one foot in the military realm, to make yourself as as marketable as you could when you when you got to the point you were you were looking for a job and you know I, I consider myself to be one of the lucky ones um, you know as as I was as just as I had finished my dissertation had contact from from a friend that was teaching at McMurray who had actually known through the living history community um, that he was a history professor there they were looking for somebody who could do public history they interviewed two people, then they interviewed a third, and that was me. And there wasn't a fourth, and the first two didn't fly. So it was it was one of those things that was meant to be. And and there there have been points in my career that I look back on, and it's it's just been you know the, those those fortuitous convergence of events, and you know ended up out in Abilene, Texas, which was really you know all things considered a great place to start a career. Yeah, I mean that's it's you know first jobs are are always interesting how you fall into them and it sounds kind of like me I mean I, I'm still convinced that the nuns at St. Francis College in Fort Wayne Indiana hired me because I was cheap I came because I came I drove from Bowling Green like an hour and a half west and yeah. they didn't have to put me up for the night or anything like that you know just paid for my gas money and that was it and I, I may have been the only person they talked to <laughs> but you know you take it right and that gets you started right. yeah yeah Absolutely. it's just right place right time so can't complain. Yeah, yeah, but you're you're our first uh, USAFA faculty member to talk with, and I was just curious, you know, what it's like to make the switch from being at a small private college uh, to to a large military academy. I mean, that, that's a well, big that's a big shift. Although it, it, I would I would wager that the the court the course size each class size I bet is pretty similar. Very similar, right? Very they similar. Keep them pretty small at, at Colorado Springs. Yeah, I mean, my my two classes this semester are nine and ten. Oh wow. wow! So it's it's really nice to have you know that that kind of one on one contact, even even more so you know to to get to know the students here and and you know be, become a part of your life. They become part of your life. Um, See, they they made they made Jay Lockenauer do all the work when he was there doing those two <laughs> classes. Remember, he told us about on on yeah. more films, yeah. and he had like twenty five in each. Yeah, that's I mean, you know, and and I've I've had I've had that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it yeah. just, you know, they have they have given me um, 
a break this semester uh, with an idea towards that. They're letting me get some research and writing done because I know yeah. I've got to work on it. Sure. So, sure. You know, you. But, you know, I'll, I'll be I'll be back at it. And then beginning next summer, I start a, a six month sabbatical. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So like I said, it wasn't a big shift then. I mean, pretty. No, I mean, the, the, the biggest shift was, you know, coming out of Abilene, Texas to beautiful Colorado Springs. And, yeah. and you know, not, like I said, Abilene was a great place to start. I miss the people there. I miss the food. I'm, I'm here in Colorado Springs where, you know, we get 300 days of sunshine a year. And, you know, like, like today, beautiful blue skies. I look out my window and, you know, I, I can't complain about the environment. And, you know, as, as someone who was, was teaching, you know, a few weeks into his first semester as a professor when 9-11 happened and having spent eight years in graduate school with either army officers who were going to teach at West Point or Air Force officers who were coming here to, to be out of the opportunity as, as the years went on after 9-11 to be able to feel like you were serving your country, the opportunity to come to Air Force. And, and I am, you know, deeply grateful to Colonel retired John Russell, former president of McMurray University, who first planted that idea in my head. Mm, yeah. And, you know, was able to make the contacts here for me that makes made coming to here as a visiting professor possible. And, and to continue to give me the support to allow me a second year here and, and to begin to understand what this place is about and now and now to be able to continue to serve and, and to help, you know, develop our our next generation of airmen and guardians for for, you know, leadership in our nation's air and space forces. That's you know, it, it doesn't get any more meaningful to me as a professor to be able to do those sorts of things. You know, that's a that's a, a common thing I've heard, you know, the, the brief times I've spent with PME at the Air War College, Army War College, et cetera, that the, the especially the civilians who are there, they take it very seriously that they're doing an important service uh, to help, you know, at that level, broaden these officers for, for senior le leadership and and you, you know, doing it at, at that level. And, I, you know, Brian and I with ROTC cadets, I mean, I, we don't take these 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 military history courses lightly, you know, yeah. for, for their sake, because you know you want to make them have some awareness and some background, and you know be able to think a little bit, right? Uh, but I, I've been well done. You know, glad glad to yeah. hear that. You know, we, sure. we we don't lose we don't usually lose wars because of technology. We lose wars because we've lost sight of the human dimension. Yeah. And as historians, you know, what's what's the first thing we do? We teach teach people how they live, right? And and yeah. how, and how to understand our adversary. Right. How, how was it? Did you have any adjustment with uh, working for you know, folks in uniform? Was it was that no. an adjustment or anything? Yeah. No, I mean, it was it was, you know, you, you, you understand how it works. Right. You, know, you, you understand there's there's going to be the bureaucracy. It's it's the nature of the beast. It's it's, yeah. you know, there, there are there, there are challenges with every institution. It's just degrees of magnitude. And, you know, when, when you understand what the mission is at the end of the day and want to contribute to that mission, it, it makes it easy. Yeah. So how many, uh, what percentage of the cadets go through one, you know, history courses, uh, but then also how many major in history? We, we have two required core courses for that all cadets take first, um, history 100, which is an intro to military history, and then history 300, which is a world history course. And okay. then we have um, probably out of every class, 15 to 30 history majors at right. a time out of each class. So oh, that's... And, and that, and that ebbs and flows depending upon, you know, what, what happens and just the whims of the respective classes. Now, do you all face the same, pre like lately, one of the things Bill and I've been hearing, and, and I think our colleagues at, at universities similar to Georgia Southern, we're always hearing like, you know, you got declining majors. That means we're going to cut faculty. That means that, you know, you've got to do all this stuff, try to get your majors up or the consequences could be catastrophic. Do you all face those same kinds of pressures? Like, do they come to you and say history majors are down or is no. it? No. Okay. I mean, we, 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 we try to do everything we can to make our major as attractive as we possibly can to cadets. And, and we, you know, do that with, with opportunities for travel, with opportunities for cadet research, with, with, with interesting and dynamic classes, with the idea that we'll, we'll attract them to the major. 
you know, we, we try to put our, our most engaging instructors in the history 100 course with the idea that that's really the recruiting course for majors. Yeah. And, you know, typically when I, when I teach it, you know, I'll, I'll have out of a class, you know, one, two, maybe three history majors out of a couple of sections. So, you know, we, we keep feeding the beast that way. And, sure. you know, it's, it's, it's also one of those, I don't, think you're going to be able to make a case at the Air Force Academy that we shouldn't teach history. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, th- I, th- I think that's probably the first thing that would generate a congressional inquiry. Yeah, you're Somebody pretty safe. The Department of History. I mean, that's good to hear because, you know, every once in a while you hear stories from like the staff colleges and the war colleges, you know, a new commandant comes in and wants to change the emphasis, switch the curriculum around or, or re redistribute contact hours, you know, that sort of thing. I know it's set up a little differently. Um, because of whatever they think is coming down from what, whatever hallway in, in the Pentagon. Um, do, do you guys have to deal with that much, or is, is it you guys pretty, le- pretty much left alone to, to do what you think is we, best? We've largely been left alone. That's good. And you, you mentioned uh, Space Force earlier. Is that something that is really being taken seriously now, or is it still kind of just on the margins? No, it's, it's I mean, we're, we're every, every class we are – we are graduating cadets into, into the space force. Okay. And, and, and we have, we have members of our department who are, who are members of the space force. So I, I guess that when they eventually, you know, teach the history of the space force, though, what do we do? Do we go back to, to NASA as the origin of, of space force? I mean, what, where, what do you think is the, the kind of, well, I mean, let's, 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 let's think about the biggest piece of spaceport space force technology that is in use every single day. GPS. When was the last? When was the last time you yeah. used your GPS? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you know, when right. was the last time you used your GPS? That's yeah. that's part and parcel of what the space force is doing, yeah. because if, if it can tell you which driveway to turn into on which street, you know, we, we can we can put an ordinance on that same location. Right. Yeah, I've got um, you know, I've got my my daughters on these uh it's called like Life 360 or something, the free edition, and uh, it's amazing. Last night, my daughter lost her phone. You, you go in and this is a free app and you can tell not only if the phone is in the house, but in what part of the house it's in. I mean, that's how, you know, crazy these free apps are. Um, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Bill, what do you think? Uh, oh, break. Yeah. Do a break. Bob, you've done a really great job of connecting your love of history um, with with the present, uh, and you've done a lot of work with uh, organizations like the the Folds of Honor Foundation. So, tell us about the Patriot and American Golf Odyssey and how you got involved in the project. I mean, when I'm looking at the webpage and the CV of a of a historian, and I see something about golf, uh, you know, I'm I've, I've got to ask exactly what that has to do with uh, with with what you do, but I'm sure it has something to do with uh, with veterans affairs and and memorializing the fallen. It actually has more to do with growing up in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Really? Okay. Because the the founder of the Folds of Honor Foundation, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney, Dan and I have known each other since we were little kids. Um, oh, okay. We, oh, we wow. Were, we, were both, huh. we were both Oklahoma State University brats. My dad, animal science, his dad in geography, and, and we both happened to go to the same church. Um, huh. He graduated high school with my little sister. So, I, so you know, we knew of each, we knew each other growing up as kids. His, his um, older sister was a year ahead of me in high school. So we had, you know, we, we had this right. knowledge of each other. And, and then Dan has, you know, what, what he calls his, his moment of, of, of synchronicity when he was coming back, flying home and, and happened, uh, on the plane and, and he can tell the story much more eloquently because obviously he lived it and has, and has told the story many, many times, but, be, but being on a plane one night where, you know, a, a brother and his twin were coming home. One was coming back um, in first class. The other one was coming back as a casualty of war and, and seeing the family on the worst night of their life and realizing that, you know, he as, as not only a, a fighter pilot had, had a, a connection with them, but, but as someone who had played golf at college and, and continued to play golf, you know, had the opportunity to perhaps collect a little money from, from a greens fee 
and and to develop a an outlet to to do to do good. And you know, over the course of the last you know since its establishment, um, the Folger Honor Foundation has just ballooned in what they're able to do in terms of giving scholarship college scholarships to the children and dependents of our our fallen and disabled servicemen and women. And my hats off to to um, to Lieutenant Colonel Dan and everything that he's done. And when when he had a golf course developed as, as kind of the home, the Folds of Honor Foundation in Owasso, Oklahoma, just, you know, an hour from where I grew up in, in Stillwater. And I saw what the golf course was and that every hole was named after a different figure in American history. I said, Dan, you need a book to go along with that. And, oh, yeah. you know, I, I know this guy. <laughs> and, you right. know, it, it ended up being between, you know, three to 4,000 words on each hole, um, ranging from George Washington to Franklin Roosevelt to Grant, Neil Armstrong, you know, kind of weave all of those together with, with, and, and we're, the manuscript is still in production at this point because, you know, life gets in the way and everybody gets yep. busy, but, but he has all the written parts in his office. So they're all with him. So I, I can say that confidently, but, you know, and to continue to be able to support the mission of Folds of Honor and do everything that I could do to publicize it and, and just talk about, you know, how much they do for our, for our servicemen and women and, and have those those connections now that, you know, I'm starting to know people who have given their lives in, in service to our country. I, you know, I wear a bracelet with one of my first students from McMurray. I've had, you know, a couple here that I know that, that have yeah. passed either in combat or an accident. And, you know, it's, it, it's, again, it's one of those opportunities that I have to give back. Yeah. Tell, tell us about the golf course itself. Is it is it designed for? I'm ass, I'm assuming it's designed for for you know for soldiers who've been fairly severely severely injured, uh, mobility issues, things like that. Or what they, is, they what they is have, that about? They have all those sorts of things. They have you know tournaments all over the country all the time. We just yeah one, fundraisers here, right here yeah. at USAFA not not too long ago. And yeah. um, you know I, I can't I can't can't say enough about what they do. They've got a new a new golf course that Jack Nicholas helped design up in up in Michigan now, that's, that's another, yeah. you know, showcase of, of the, of, of the organization. And, you know, I, I love seeing Dan on TV when he's pushing the mission and, and, and rep and folds. And I, you know, usually when I'm at a, a football game, I'm wearing something folds of honor. Brian up here at the, the QTs, uh, they, they are partners with the folds of honor foundation. And so their stuff is all. Oh yeah. Like there at QTs. Yeah. yeah. I have, you're right. I've noticed that yeah. when I'm, when I've been out pumping. You probably see those brochures right by the yeah. pumps. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Huh. All right. Well, well, we'll get, we'll add to our shout outs then. Folds of Honor. Um, anyone yeah, unaware absolutely. of what it is, uh, Google it, take a look at it. Uh, great, great organization. Um, and if you're one of those people that, that likes to, uh, you know, make donations to things that matter, looks like that's a, a organization that can make a real difference. Did you hear that? Was, was no, that just over? flew over. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> just flew over. Noon, do, noon meal formation. Yeah. Do, do you get that? Do you get that every once in a while? <laughs> you know what's even better is when they come over and I get one of these. Oh, that's oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I had I had one at graduation parade last year. Big B two Clint came over, and and it was one of my kids saying hi because yeah. he let me know ahead of time he was coming. Oh I, wow! I to say, hey, can it can I get a wig wig waggle? He's like, sure <laughs> up, just as it went over. That's, that's awesome. Cool. So, that is the, awesome. The, the football game last week we had a C seventeen flyover and uh, I knew the pilot. So you know the oh, the, yeah. the perks of working in a place like this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, uh, yeah, for sure. Have you ever got to ride on anything like that? Yes. I, I'm what they call an officer of record for the, and I'll throw this out, the Mountain West Championship, United States Air Force Academy baseball team. And uh, they're, they're actually getting their rings and are going to be recognized on the field again tomorrow again in the game against Navy, but they typically travel by mill air. Yeah. Really? They have to take officers with them. So, you know, I, I have the opportunity to, you know, to, to jump on the bus with them, go down to the to the uh, to the jetway, and and usually from the time we get off the bus to wheels up on a C seventeen, it's about ten minutes. Yeah, it's, it's nice not not having to wait uh, in a terminal. Yeah, yeah, there's no there's no TSA <laughs> or anything. You just yeah. go right on. Right? Just go get on <laughs> yeah. the plane and you go. Yeah, yeah. They sure you don't go on a C seven or what do they go on? Yeah, usually a C seventeen. C seventeen. Although although we have gone on the. Uh, they're really rolling around today. Um, oh, I can we hear have that gone on the yeah. yeah, yeah. You hear that one? Yeah, I heard that one. The congressional uh, 747. We've got we've taken that on a couple of occasions. Oh, that's cool. Which is nice. So all the seats are first class. You can sit at the couch or on the conference table. That's amazing. 
That is awesome. Yeah. It helps when the head baseball coach is a transport guy and, and knows all the pilots and can, and can help them do that as part of their mission. Right. Bob, let's talk about your, your work in oral history and, and also public history too, I think, uh, because, because that's a big deal to us. Our MA program is largely a public history uh, em- emphasis. And we've, we've done really well at it the past several years, but we've been doing this for, you know, God, at least a couple of decades. And when you look at the increasingly ephemeral nature of, you know, texts and emails and Twitter, are oral histories going to become more important? And if so, but then also how do you make sure that they are reliable when all this other stuff is going to be more difficult to deal with? Uh, if not because it's short and, and un, you know, unclear, but also uh, disappearing, it's going to be lost. It's going to be, yeah. it's going to disappear. Well, you know, I, I, I think particularly in those instances where you, you, have what you understand to be a significant event transpiring in real time. Mm-hmm. There are going to be efforts to to save the, the the transient electronic details because you might need those later. And and, yeah. I, and I think of that specifically on, on two occasions that I've encountered. You know, first with the Waldo Canyon fire in 2013 that came right up to the southern edge at the Air Force Academy, and at the time was the most catastrophic fire in the history of Colorado. And and with the involvement of the Air Force Academy as part of the incident management team, you know, there there was a desire to collect and preserve all of that. And as someone who was teaching a historic research methods class at next fall, I collected it from, from all over town all over, you know, locations nationally, and then made those resources available to cadets as they picked out different pieces of, of, of the fire to write about, you know, to, to really put them in place of using all this and, you know, came up with some, some really great documents that, you know, I've, I've got probably one of the best archives on that incident still, still sitting on my computer. And then a, a just a few years ago in, in 2018, you had the Ute Park fire, which affected Philmont Scout Ranch, right. which is a location near and dear to my heart. My daughter was working down there that summer. And, you know, the fire starts and within 48 hours, you have communication through the Air Force Academy because we have a very active program by which we send cadets down to the Air Force Academy to work at Philmont in the summer. We were ready to move all of Philmont staff up to our training area in Jacks Valley because you had a who staffed the Air Force and Dave Goldfein, who was a former Philmont staffer and a secretary of the Air Force and Heather Wilson, who was not only from New Mexico, but her husband was a big scouter too. And, you know, we had that, that chain of command and that discussion, and we've got all those email connections in addition to having the oral histories. So I, I think you're still going to see, you know, those sorts of things going, going hand in hand. And, you know, the electrons are never going to go away. Yeah. Someone's someone's <clears throat> going to have them somewhere, which is you know one one of the, the the benefits and hazards of living in the electronic world. Um, but but we're we're still going to have, I mean, Bill, we're, we still have access. I mean, I've been spending the last week pouring through the Ike Skelton archives at Command and General Staff, going through yeah you know, after action reports from 1944. That, that are that are that were written on onion skin and probably a lot of those the the paper themselves have deteriorated but we've got them scanned electronically and we can still get to them oh yeah and that's you know it's the same like with a lot of vietnam stuff in the national archives it's it's so incomplete because a lot of that stuff deteriorated while it was still in vietnam because right. of the, the the weather conditions the humidity and you know mimeograph paper and stuff like that i mean things are incredibly incomplete so I hadn't thought of it that way, but I guess it's 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 all all relative. Um, I will say that that I'm having flashbacks to to Philmont. I hadn't thought about that in years. I, I hiked that. I did that as a Boy Scout in like 1980, I think. Yeah. Well, that's that's where I'm heading on my sabbatical. So. Oh yeah. Oh wow. What are you going to do? We're just going to be hang the, out there. Or. Yeah, it's it's being finalized right now, but there's um, I'm developing a historian in residence position for down there. Oh, oh cool. wow! How neat. That's awesome. It'll be a combination of working with and evaluating some of their programs and and doing some research for a book on Philmont. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the things I was thinking of uh, about you know the electronic records 
versus oral histories, you know, the different service history offices like, you know, uh, Center of Military History for the Army, et cetera, you know, having to get all that information, they've got to send historians out to the field, they've got to grab, you know, Captain so-and-so's laptop before he wipes it clean, before they rotate back to the States, to get all this information off of it. And they do that, but they, they end up with just a gazillion, whatever byte ton of just bits. And it's like, how do you even begin to start sorting that stuff out? And what I didn't realize until I was on the Army's Historical Advisory Committee those, those years was how important, not only for the history, but that information is critical for veterans benefit claims. Oh, yeah. Because they got to be able to show that they were there at a certain time, you know, in this place or what what have you, which it could be for something that develops health wise 30 years from now. Right. Were you were you at Camp Lejeune? <laughs> actually, actually, he was. <laughs> yes, I was. My dad, we were there in 1967. Uh, I don't came, I don't know how long my dad has looked at it. He's not sure. He's got Agent Orange related uh, health issues, and and I asked him about it. I'm like, do you think it's Camp Lejeune? And he didn't think so. I've not had any issues. My mom has not had any issues that would show up on that. So, but he's also worried about the claims process. If you if you file a claim for one, that might negate you for the other because they're going to come back and say, well, which one is it? Right. Yeah. So what do you, do you, do you guys do? I, I, you probably don't at the, at the Air Force Academy because I don't know, correct me, but is, is there a, any sort of public history activity or emphasis in, in the history program? No, we, we, we yeah, really just don't. can't. Yeah. I mean, we, we are so prescribed in terms of number of hours that they have. You yeah. Know, yeah. Cadets come right. here. They, they really don't major in history. They major in our right. core curriculum. Yeah. Right. You know, right. And, and, and getting all of those technical skills that they need um, yeah. for the Air Force. And, and we kind of give them a little taste. We, you know, there, there are some opportunities where we've done some special projects and, and cadets have engaged in some things outside of the classroom, but, but unfortunately just doesn't, just doesn't. Yeah. Wow. Do you um, think it's fair to describe, you know, the, the academies and, and the curriculums and whatnot, and obviously their purpose, but, but the curriculum and, and, and all that, that compared to a Georgia Southern or a McMurray, that they're about, I don't know, five to eight degrees off you know, what we what we would consider as normal and standard is because of the nature of those places, right? They right. have to do things a little differently and have different emphases. Well, and, and you know, it's, it's as, as I, I tell cadets, you know, when, when you come here, major in what you like. Don't yeah. worry about majoring in something because of what you're going to need on a career trajectory. Yeah. You know, the, the, the important thing is, you know, Find, finding a life at this place that you can enjoy because you've, you've got the hard part figured out. You know, when, when, you, when you look at a traditional institution, if you want to major in history, what's the first question a student's going to get? What are you going to do with that? Right. Well, and, and, preach, and here preach I, man, I, preach. That's I, I hear I tell my cadets, hey, you know, don't let anyone say, well, what are you going to do with a degree in history? You're going to be an Air Force officer. And, and by the time you are done and are looking to get a job where you get to decide what you wear every day, you know, <laughs> you're going to be a former Air Force officer, and that's why people are going to hire you. Yeah. Yeah. So in the meantime, major in the discipline that's going to make you the sought-after commodity among your peers when they're playing trivia on Saturday nights at the bar, because you're going to know more worthless stuff than anybody else, but at the same time, you are going to write and speak more clearly than anyone else. And that's going to make you a value to your commander. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's sage advice. Absolutely. Sage advice. Brian, I think Bob has done, done, done wonderful for us today. And, he has, uh, he has earned the right to, to play I think so. rapid yeah. fire. Yeah. Yeah. One of these days we're, we might have to turn somebody down. We well, got, we have, well, otherwise it doesn't make, mean anything, right? Like, yeah. Right. Find... It's got, it's got to mean, we got to turn someone. Yeah. To make it mean something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Bob, I don't know if you've listened to these before, but we do a rapid fire thing. We have 10 questions. Brian will ask a couple. I'll ask a couple. And, uh, you know, be prepared for the barbecue question at the end, obviously. What do I get if I win? <laughs> oh, oh, we've got. Yeah, we'll send prizes. you a, we'll send you a koozie. Yep. Big prizes. 
So we'll do that, see how you do. We'll comment, of course, and judge a little bit. Brian, go. All right. Recommend a book you recently read that is not related to history. I, I don't read anything other than history for fun. Okay, then give us, the, give us the best thing out of your wheelhouse, like something you read that's not related to what you're researching. Michael Twitty's The Cooking Gene. Okay. The hmm. Cooking Gene. The Cooking Gene. And I, I saw on your uh, Twitter that you've also recently purchased Black Smoke. So, yes, uh, love that one too. All right. A Adrian's a great guy. All right. Is that the um, book that came from UNC Press? Yeah. Yeah. yeah got it right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Got it right there. Got, yeah, had, had the opportunity to meet him last spring. Just a, a fascinating. He's just up the road in Denver. Interesting. Um, and, and just a, a, it was very validating for me to see a lot of the things that I taught appearing in print. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Good deal. All right. Best work of history that you recently read? Peter Caddick Adams, Sand and Steel. Sand and, and, and Steel. I, and I what is think that? It, it's a, a relook, relook at the Normandy invasion. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. And there's, and there's something to be said for reading the chapter on Omaha Beach, sitting in the Vereville draw with a nice glass of red wine, listen to, listening to the waves crash on the beach. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I think yeah. the, clo the closest I can get to that is uh, I, I stole some some sand from Omaha Beach and uh, it's in my office. That's that's about as close as I'm going to get anytime soon. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got that too. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, you get to listen to one band or singer for the rest of your life. Who? Mm. I'll go with the one I've met, Phil Collins. Oh, oh yeah, Phil Collins. Phil has done some some great stuff solo and with the band he's got like arthritis to the point that he can't really play anymore right doesn't he have yes. a got, yeah. got, got to got to see him on his last solo concert right before covid um but but the highlight was getting to meet him yeah that's cool that's that is really cool i feel bad for him in his alamo stuff he's really having a hard time with his alamo collection oh that that's how i met him oh um, really yeah he's, he's, his publisher for his Alamo collection was a former colleague of mine. Okay. Actually got to meet him when the book rolled out. Yeah. So just, just some absolutely amazing artifacts. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Why no, is he, he so I mean, he's got a great collection of legit stuff, but he also got, you know, which, you know, I guess is not, that shouldn't be surprising. You yeah. get conned a little bit. Yeah. Has um, he ever said why he's so crazy about the Alamo? Just Saw Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier, when he was yeah. Up. And every time they'd go to San, like played in San Antonio, he would go down there and just hang out. Like and he'd then, just and then he, walking in around. 1980, yeah, in 1986, he popped into one of the shops that were yep. selling antiques. And if you're Phil Collins, you got more money than God. You can pay for that stuff. Yeah, and that's and that's how the collection started. Boy, Phil Collins, I, I'm okay with that. It's not Billy Joel, which I was glad. I, I was I was starting to worry there for a minute. Bob, if we ever, if someone ever says Billy Joel, that's when we're stopping. We're just doing like, okay, this is stupid. We can't do this anymore. Okay, got it. Got it. <laughs> that's kind of a, that's kind of the lot. That's our line in the sand, Mr. Right. Travis. Uh, okay, what do you got? What are you binge watching? Westworld with my daughter. Oh, Westworld. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good. Better College Town, College Station, or Stillwater? Stillwater. College yeah. Station's too big. Oh. Really? Yeah. It's too big. Okay. I, What's I the size compared to Oklahoma State and, and A&M? Oak State's about 30, 35. 35 and A&M's over 50. Now it's, it? is pushing north of 50. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think for me, I think the ideal college is about between 30 and 40,000. You get much beyond that, then it just gets too big. Like yeah. city-ish, yeah. yeah. That's like, you know, I, Ohio State was a city. Um, it, it doesn't feel like you're on a, a college campus. It feels like you're in, you know. Wait, wait, you didn't you didn't say it right. The Ohio State yeah. University. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, as I like or as I like to say, the pretentious OSU. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I saw a student walking across campus at Georgia Southern last week, and she had on a shirt that said the, and then it had the buckeye colors going through it. And I was like, Oh yeah, I gotta get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was one of the things I did when I was at AM. Um one of our previous head coaches at, at Oklahoma State, Pat Jones, always used to show up wearing an Oklahoma Aggies sweatshirt. Yeah. So, you know, when I was down at AM, I had to go get an Oklahoma Aggies t shirt just to wear around campus. And oh, make, yeah. Make Absolutely. the undergrads' heads. 
All right. Um, what is your death row meal? So uh, imagine you've been put on death row. You get one last meal. It can be anything. No price is not an issue. What's it going to be? Mm, gosh, that's a tough one. I know. <laughs> because it would be two, two restaurants who were near and dear to my heart in two locations. With with can can I get a side from somewhere else? Yeah, go for, for it. Sure. Yeah. Oh. Uh, would probably be a Ranchos ribeye from Perini Ranch Steakhouse in Buffalo Gap, Texas, with a side of pep bacon cheese fries from Eskimo Joe's. That's pretty specific. <laughs> yeah, that is very All specific. Right. Yeah. That's pretty good, man. That's the first time we've asked that question. That was good. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Yeah. I like that. All right. What is your grill of choice for your barbecuing activities? I've, I've got two. You know, I've got my I've got my gas grill for a steak, and I've yep. got my smoker for for taking pair of my brisket, my ribs. What, what my kind brisket. of smoker do you have? I've got an old Oklahoma Joe's. Um, it's now the company is now Horizon Smokers out of Perry, Oklahoma. It's a nice, heavy, solid, um, you know, quarter inch steel that that holds its weight really well. Right. You know, I moved that thing across country three times, and it you know, the only thing I want is a bigger one. <laughs> Does it have like an indirect box? How's it set up? Yeah, it's it's an it's an offset barrel. Yeah, offset barrel. Yeah. Um, have you watched Aaron Franklin's master class? Yes. Right. I, yes. I learned a lot, but his his book um, is also good. I have it sitting on my shelf. Yeah. Yeah. His, his smoked meat manifesto. Right. Um, I loved how he he starts his fire. You know, it's at it's late at night, early in the morning, I guess, and he pulls up a lawn chair. He's got like a cup of coffee and he sits there for about two or three minutes. It doesn't say anything. Yeah. And then he turns to the camera and says, oh, this is called watching the fire. This is really important. <laughs> hey, I figured out he and I overlapped in College Station by about a year. Oh, yeah. As, as I was finishing up, he was just getting started before he went to Austin. Best Star Wars film. Ooh, gosh. I mean, obviously, you you got to start where it all began. But yeah. if I had to go beyond the, the the initial trilogy, the the one that I mean, it, it's a toss up between Rogue One and Solo. I, okay. I think I think Solo is really underrated. I think it. Came I like out, Solo. Yeah, it came out in an oversaturated market, and it yeah. just didn't have a place. I think you space it out another year or two. And it does a lot better at the box office. I thought the story the story was good. Yeah, they had a fantastic story arc. Yeah, and, and, and to see you know where it all began and to know where the pieces. I think that's to me that was the gift of of the storyteller to make the old pieces blend with the new pieces as seamlessly as they did, and you understand a lot. Yeah, yeah. Don't you find you know talking with students today who who watch the new films and everything, and they they may look back at the originals and kind of like ah you know. That was such a big deal. Yes. Right? Don't you yes. ever go in to see it as a kid yeah. in a movie theater? And, well, and, and, and just being like, holy crap. And then this this guy walks in with the black and this breathing and the German helmet on. And you're like, he's a bad guy. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, it yeah. was an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, whatever it was. Like, okay, that that's the bad guy. Well, right? and to be able to take and share that experience with your children. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and now, you know, as, I, as I'm doing it with my son and my daughters, we're watching – and or or when we were watching ben kenobi kenobi last summer it was it right. was just you know you, you have that you share something new with your kids yeah very good all right question it's gonna be uh close to your heart can mike gundy coach at osu as long as he wants yes without without ever making the cfp yes why do you think that is who are you going to get any better all right and it's always and, and this is having driven in in driver's ed in high school with the athletic director at OSU. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not going to find anybody with a better mullet. No. Right? I mean, love that Arkansas waterfall. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, as I was getting ready for this, I was looking at his stuff last night. I was like, all right. Man, you know. he's 55. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah, got. No, he's our age. Yeah. He's yeah. Really, yeah. He's, well, he, he, he was the quarterback the year I graduated from high school. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. With, with, with handing the ball off to Barry Sanders. Yeah. 
that was a true. tough job. That was a That's tough right. job. I handed it off to Thurman Thomas the year before. I was going to say, yeah, I think I could have been a, a star quarterback on that team. You just turn around <laughs> and hand the ball off. <laughs> but, you know, last, last went, went to watch their last game and, and to see him take the ball away from the quarterback in the first quarter when he's when they're up 35 nothing, he's thrown for 242. And then as a parent, I don't care who you are. It's a dusty room when you see a head coach hand the football off to his son who's wearing the same number that his dad did in college. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that was just amazing to watch. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question. Um, I think I know where it is. It's going to fall for you. Uh, when it comes to barbecue, is it brisket or is it pork? Brisket. Yeah, I didn't think that. I had a shot with you, uh, with your, your <laughs> Oklahoma, because I'm – I'm South Carolina, so uh, I I tend to go with the uh, with the pork. Um, with a mustard sauce, or you with a, a vinegar sauce? Uh, I'm vinegar sauce. I grew up in upstate South Carolina, so the mustard you get more down towards. Uh, you know, you want to give a shout out to any place in Colorado Springs? Good barbecue. Well, you know, I, I I talked about my best friend, and if you ask him what's the best barbecue in Colorado Springs, he'll tell you my house. Well, we've heard that from somebody. We have heard that. We have yeah. heard that. Yeah, we have heard tell of your expertise. So, so all right, the, the I'm dropping the invite. All right, come all right, on yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. So we understand that you do a hell of a tailgate. I I have been known to you know put some put some meat down on fire. Yeah. But I mean, like night before, whatever, setting up, you know, everything. We we, we have done bit. that on occasion. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I go and I go and borrow our smoker from church, take it up to the stadium, and. You know, start cooking about five o'clock the night before and cook all night. Haven't done that in a number of years. Um, you know, Bill, you said earlier the years are catching up with you. They're catching up with me too. Yeah. What if what I'm typically doing now is after parents weekend or during parents weekend after the football game, um, they have here at the Air Force Academy a cadet sponsor program where you kind of open your home to to cadets. And we've, yeah. we've got a group of we've got uh, about ten cadets that that we sponsor as part of our family that are in different class years all the way through. Right. And and after the football game, we have a, a barbecue for for our cadet parents. And you know, uh, this year I did a brisket, two pork shoulders, and two chickens. And you know, just had everybody over and 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 fed them after the game. And so that's kind of what it's moved to now. So where where do you get your your meat? I just go to Costco. Just Costco. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been you know pretty pleased with with what they've got. And you know, when you can get it, it's it's as, as good as anywhere else. The, the trick is what you do with it once you get it. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, the good thing for you, you got that, you got that smoker, you know, you can, you can get a, what, what size brisket you usually get there? Oh, I usually get a 14, 15, pound. 14, 15 pound. Yeah. See, see, I've just got a, I have a medium big green egg and, and I, that won't fit on there. It's too big. Yeah. So I got to cut, well, cut them in half. I'll do it in waves. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll do my, I'll do my pork shoulders first, then pull those off. Right. And put the brisket on and then finish everything off in the oven. And that yeah. you know, does well. Ah, we, ah, one day, man. Got to get we'll out, out there. there. Yeah. Got to experience this. Got an invitation. Sure. All yeah. right. Thank you. No, you, you have a reputation, man. You, yeah. you do. You're, you're, you got a reputation for sure. Well, you know, if, if there was, there was a time if this history thing didn't work, <laughs> Yeah. I was, I was going to, I had a name for it and everything. I was going to open that barbecue place. That, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that barbecue. let's go to that barbecue place. Yeah, I was just trying to find an old rundown gas station that didn't have EPA issues, and then I'd been set. Right. Yeah. Good. Good luck with one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck finding that. But still, that I don't know, man. Maybe when you retire, I, I can see it. Yeah. Well, when I was when I was teaching during COVID, and the cadets were restricted in terms of where they could go to eat, all they could eat was drive through. So on, on two nights during the course of the semester, I had a pop-up restaurant open in my garage that was called that barbecue place. Oh, <laughs> and they came up to my garage and I served them. That's nice. awesome, man. That's great. That's very uh, cool. Well, Bob, this has been a delight. This has been has so much been. fun. We yeah. really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to, to talk with us because I know you've got, got classes going on. You don't have to deal with a hurricane like we do. No. Um, not that we've really had to deal with it. No, we just have no. Navy coming in tomorrow. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I, I think you guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, it stopped raining, but the wind's blowing pretty good. But anyway, we really appreciate you taking the time. And yeah, oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Good, yeah, it's good to chat with you, man. Finally, finally get get to you. So, so thanks for doing it.
Military Historians Are People Too is produced, written, and hosted by Brian Feltman and Bill Allison. Music is written and performed by Bill Allison, who clearly is not BJ Lederman. Military Historians Are People Too is hosted on Anchor by Spotify. Check back soon for new episodes. Thanks for listening.